Okay, hold on a second here. There we go. Pat, what is up, brother? I appreciate you taking the time to join us here today on the podcast, man. What's new? It's my pleasure, buddy. It's good to see you. Um, not much new. Same old, always, uh, you know, family life now with the baby and the wife and working and trying to just train and get ready for semifinals. That's right. I know that this is a busy time of year, so that's why I'm extra grateful for you taking the time to kind of sit on here and chat with me a little bit. Man, you have been in the sport for many years at this point. People always want to throw the the old dog your way with the the old dog titles and the old uh, the old jokes. I mean, I'm I'm much older than you, so I'm not going to start there. But what I will say, and I want to open with, is I've always been a fan. I love the way that you carry yourself as an athlete. It seems as though you've got a competitive nature that kind of you know aligns with simil similarly to the way that I came up in the sport competitively. Um, so I think we've always had some similarities that way. But you're much fitter than I, and I will gladly take the back seat to that. And, you know, one of my things, and, and I'm just opening with this story is that, and I shared this with Dan, with Dan who's producing this thing. He, uh, bro, this year at Wadapalooza, there was an event. Okay. There was an event that had Pat Vellner written all over it. In fact, and you probably <laughs> know exactly which one I'm talking about. I'm, I'm sure I do. <laughs> but you, you, you went out on the floor and you executed the event the way that I predicted that you would. And then in the interview after. I believe the question was thrown your way. Hey, Pat, what was what was the hardest part about the strategy for this workout? Or what was your mindset going into this workout? And your reply was, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the hardest decision I had to make about this workout is what I wanted to wear because I knew I was going to win and what I what I wanted to have on for this interview. Is that the truth? <laughs> yeah, that is, I think, roughly what I said. I don't know. I think I was maybe being a little tongue in cheek with what was the hardest part, but sometimes you got to throw a little shade at the other guys and keep them honest. Bro, I loved it so much. You have no idea. I told Dan <laughs> that story. Dan was like, yeah, you could tell him what you said, but you were. <laughs> I, I just, I, literally my response is like, I don't know Pat intimately. I think I'd like to know. Can, I don't know if I can get you. Can you hear him? <laughs> yeah, I can hear him. Okay, cool. I, I, you, you, earned, you earned a new fan in a very, <laughs> very uh, deep rooted level where now when I speak about Michael Jordan, and yeah, I don't know. I think it's fun to have some fun like that. I think especially competitions like that, where there's maybe, you know, less on the line, like game seats and things like that. Um, uh, it's fun to talk a little trash, you know, I think, CrossFit's been so, I don't know, people, people are pretty, pretty nice all the time in CrossFit. So I think it is funny to sometimes throw something like that out there and it catches people on their heels and it, it's always a good for a laugh. I think there's a lot of that banter in the back, but it's not always that forward facing. So it is, it's funny to get one of those out there. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of the guys expected me to win that one. So nobody was, nobody's feelings was too hurt. Hey man, they knew what the pecking order was, but I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're willing to do that on the front side. And I think as fans and even, you know, someone that's kind of getting into the space on the commentary side, it is fresh to see. I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but I really believe that my age demographic, I'm 36. I grew up in the best time in sports fandom to be a fan of sports, meaning that we saw the Emmett Smith, the Michael Jordans, the, the Wayne Gretzky's the, but these guys went at each other's throats, man. Like they were fierce competitors. But that's what I love so much. And so when I came up in the sport and it was Matt Chan and Tommy Hackenbrook and Chris Spieler and Josh Bridges and these guys jaw jacking back and forth, I'm like looking like, are they going to fight each other? Or is this, you know what I'm saying? And then to see you and Brett go back and forth or um, who else did you guys have in that, in that mix up there in the North where you guys were throwing down during the open and having to do some embarrassing things? Yeah, Joe Scally and Brent and a guy named Mitch Barnard were the guys who kind of started that. And then I got pulled into it years later. And we've had a few guys, uh, a few of the American athletes have joined in. We've had a couple of Europeans involved over the years. It's a lot of fun. Like, it just kind of makes things fun. It's a lot of pride on the line. It's, it makes us care about things like the Open on a level that maybe we otherwise wouldn't. And so it, it kind of just puts a little more skin in the game and it makes it more fun. But yeah, I agree. Like, you know, there is and there is that intensity on the sports side but i think crossfit's in a weird place where it sort of straddles two worlds where you're trying to be inclusive from the training side and and you know get people involved and don't be intimidating because that's not really the point we're trying to help people on if their fitness journeys and meet people where they're at right but you know the elite sports side of it 
is just a different thing. And I think most of the people you see that are competing for the top spots at the games or frankly competing at the games period or, or, or trying to get there, their goals are very different and they know what they're there for. So, you know, it is that stuff is not off the table. And I think I said, I think a lot of it happens behind the scenes and it's been something that probably cross cross. It doesn't uh, show all the time because it, it maybe doesn't present the best for their other side of, uh, of their industry. But uh, we always we always have a good laugh. There's a lot of that out there. I'm sure you could tell a lot of stories, and I know I can. So it's fun. It's fun to get it out there now and then. Yeah, it's it's what it's what kind of keeps us, uh, you know, more more low key throughout the season, right? We understand that it can be an extremely stressful process, and so I think that if HQ is smart. They're going to let that stuff lead from the front and continue to just show the difference between what it's like in an affiliate because it's completely different, like you mentioned. And then, of course, what happens on the competition floor because what makes us ruthless as athletes is what makes the sport great. Um, with that being said, man, you've always had and been known for this mentality of having the ability to train alone throughout your career. And as you've been doing it for many years, I mean, you stepped on the floor, was it 2015, on a team? And then, of course, after that, you were on as an individual athlete. How, how have you continued to be, to be like renewed or rejuvenated training all that time alone when I know that was a struggle for myself finding that balance? And I know there are athletes that feel like they absolutely need training partners out there in the space just to get in the gym for consistently week in and week out. It's tough. I think that it takes, you know, it takes a certain kind of person to be able to do that. Uh, and and I, I get my check-ins here and there, like all, you know, for years I would kind of go spend a week or two in Montreal every year and train with my coach and have some other athletes around or, you know, try to get out here and there. But to, I, I actually find that year round to have training partners, you sort of, you beat the shit out of each other. Like you, you can pummel each other to a point that you're not really training anymore. You're missing the point and you're kind of competing every day. And that's an easy way to get hurt. It's an easy way to get run down. You have to be very careful when you're competing with a lot of training partners. So, you know, I think, it gets in your head a little bit. It, it's easy to not be confident when you've got no measuring stick. You know, when I come into a competition and I haven't even seen another athlete compete in like three months, other than maybe what they've shown me on Instagram, which is not necessarily representative of, uh, of the real deal. So I don't know. A lot of the time I generally, I don't want to say you train scared, but I, I expect to see the, the best version of everybody else um, that they could possibly be every time I take the floor. So you know, when inevitably they aren't that, you know, you're, you're just over prepared. Right. So I think I've always kind of looked at it that way. Like I, I'm picturing, you know, the best version of every person I could see in every wheelhouse workout they could imagine and what that situation would look like. And I try to use that to motivate myself, but it's hard. It's not, it's not easy. And I think that a, a big part of, you know, learning to do that, learning to train by yourself, learning to continue to push your threshold when you are by yourself starts to give you a huge advantage in competition, like the level of focus it takes to, you know, stay completely locked in when you've got a 30 minute workout and you've got to be focused for 30 minutes. You learn that when you've got to stay focused by yourself. I don't have people next to me to tell me how fast to go. Um, I, I think that it's a learned skill. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I've just for years, I, I kind of had to do it. And then, you know, now I think most of the time I would choose to do it um, because it just, it, it's something that works for me. And I think, there's a lot of noise and a lot of other things that come along with, with other people training with you all the time. I, the one luxury that I have, I work a pretty busy schedule between my family life, my, my occupation and my training. So I don't have to wait for people. I can show up, I can get through my stuff. I have to be snappy. Sometimes I have to be agile and it allows me to do that because I don't have to wait around for anybody else. It's like, it's as fast as I can get through it. It's as fast as, as I want to make it. Um, I go, you know, where I, where I need to, when I have to, and, and then I, it's done and I can go home. Um, so that is a benefit of it is you're kind of, you're only accountable to yourself. Absolutely, man. And I appreciate you sharing all that. I think it makes a, a world of sense to me. And you mentioned something that I think was really key in that, in that statement as you, as going back, you, you mentioned about training scared and when, when you have that type of mindset and mentality, how do you balance that with your own personal confidence? Like, how do you, cause I, I'm, I'm wired very similarly um, in regards to, I've always got doubts on how I'm performing. It could be a great day, man. And I'm like, not good enough tomorrow. We're going to be even better. We're just building, we're packing. And then when you show up on the floor, how do you still manage then knowing that you belong or knowing that you can take the crown? 
That's hard. I think that that's why I tend to settle in and feel better as competitions go. I think that once you that first time you step on the floor, there's a lot of unknowns out there. Like you kind of know what you're bringing to the table, but you have no idea what everybody else is playing with. And then as things wear on, you get to see what people are, where they're at. And you sort of figure out roughly where you fit into that and, and, you know, how you can attack certain workouts relative to your competitors. Um, That's a hard, I mean, it's, it's difficult. You, you have to, I mean, I would say this, I, I'm never more nervous than for events that I should be very great at. Um, I think that, you know, pressure is a privilege, but there, there's a reason why people are looking at you to win those events. There's a reason why people are saying, oh, you know, you got to watch out for Adrian on that one and whatever. Like you come by those accolades, honestly, over time and you accumulate that respect over time. Um, so, you know, I think that I, I always wonder when I show up if I'm still that guy this time around. And, uh, you know, usually once you, once you take the floor and things relax a little bit, um, you're able to perform to your standard, but yeah, I mean, it's hard. I, I think that I, I always feel that pressure. And I think that I, that's another reason why I can train by myself is I, I put that pressure on myself daily and I feel that all the time. And then when it's time to show up and deliver on it, you tend to step up to the plate and make it happen. I love that, man. I love that. And we're talking a lot about competing, of course, because that is what you're gearing up to do this year. I want to reference back a time when, when it's like you and Frazier out there and you've, you've had many years of having this type of scenario where you're on the floor, same time as Matt. He's notorious for kind of looking that left to right, um, getting to identify where the rest of the field is. Because you train alone so much, and I know notoriously he even did his thing most of the time alone until his latter year where he connected with Tia a bunch. But when, when you're out on the floor, do you have that same kind of awareness and space on regards to, hey, so-and-so's here, they're creeping on me here, this is where I'm losing time, or is it completely locked in on, this is my pace, this is my threshold, I got to ride this thing until I know I can't anymore? I think it sometimes depends on what we're doing, but I think that most of the best athletes, whether they'll admit it to you or not, are very good at knowing where people are, understanding where and when to push. And that's what makes a, a good competitor. Truth be told, there's not a lot that physically separates a lot of the athletes in a lot of ways. So I think being intelligent about when you you attack on somebody, when you're gonna push, you can break athletes mentally pretty easily um, in a lot of cases if you're smart about when you do it. You know, an, an aggressive transition at the right time, even if you're faking it and you're like looking not tired, you can make somebody fall off you. Um, and as soon as they fall off your back, it's an easy road to victory. And that's that happens all the time. You see the best athletes do it. Um, I think that, you know, you say you know, Matt trained a lot by himself as well. And I think that the reality you see sometimes is uh, people will work as hard as they have to. Um, and some of the best athletes we've seen do that for years. I'm not trying to win by 30 seconds. Like I will win by one second. If it means I work less hard, that's fine. Win by just enough that I know I don't have to stress across the line. But like, if you've got an event where you're comfortable in, I don't need to beat people by minutes. Like I'll watch where everybody is and I'll, I'll, I'll cruise myself to victory and that's fine. Um, but that means knowing the times to beat from the previous heats. That means knowing where people are and what their strengths are. So if you, you expect someone to push hard on you in the last, 30 seconds you better be prepared for it like that's a it's a dangerous game to play but you know if it means saving yourself for other stretches during the weekend it's smart like that's an intelligence play that's a you know that's a a competitor who's preparing themselves for a long weekend right so we've seen it a lot in the people that are best and i think that yeah i tend to do that a lot myself sometimes you've got to you've got to send it and there's no other choice some events are fast some are high impact some things there's very little room for error but events like that one at Wadapalooza where there's a little time, there's a lot of space, there's a lot of movement on the floor where you Transition. can see where people yep. are going. Yeah, it's great. Like it's those are fantastic events to try to see where your competitors are and analyze and, and be smart. So it's sometimes like I'm I'm not trying I'm trying to work the least hard possible for the most points possible. It's generally how mm. I'm trying to take the floor. <laughs> so hey, if I can make it easier on myself, <laughs> I I got no no problem with that, right? Yeah. So, and I don't think there's any shame in that. You don't have to go and blow your brains out every workout. Um, and often it's not the best pathway to success. No, man, I love it. And I think you're, you know, you're preaching to the choir, but I think it's important for people to hear and understand young competitors in the space. It's important for them to know. And it's a great message to hear. You know, everyone's going to have their own journey where sometimes you are trying to blow out the field because you know you can. Um, 
And sometimes you're going to inch them out by just enough. And sometimes, like you mentioned, you're going to pick a pace just a little slower or just a little faster than someone to draw them out of their pace specifically. And that takes me back to this year's initial open announcement, 22.1. You out there on the floor competing against uh, Noah Olson. Noah Olson coming out like a like a crazy man. A little bit fast yeah, coming out, you just coming kinda, out like Noah Olson does kind of like <laughs> Noah does. And you just kind of watched him do his thing. You stayed a few steps behind the whole time. Casually. Was there a point in that workout? And I say that just because I know so much of the community got an opportunity to, to watch that take place. Was there a point in that workout where you legitimately made a choice? Okay. Now's the time this is go, or was it truly just a sustained effort where you didn't slow and he kind of came off that initial pace? I think it's more that I was pretty consistent. Um, I think when there's a little blood in the water, you start to move. And I would like to first say, neither of us crushed that workout. I think we both got smashed a bit by the altitude. Uh, and I think seeing a lot of the other scores that came out afterwards, we were like, oh yeah, we weren't moving as fast as we thought. <laughs> but I will say from the from jump, I, I thought Noah was moving very fast. And he's also good at all those movements. So I kind of... I think I looked up at like the three minute mark and I said, well, if Noah can move this fast for this 15 yeah. minutes, then he'll just crush me and that's fine. Um, but I, I was just like, I don't think I can push a lot faster than this and sustain it. So I was just like, yeah, I'm going to be steady and try to save something for like the last three rounds of pushing or something like that. Um, and about halfway, I, he, you know, faltered a little on a box jump or got a no rep on a dumbbell snatch or something. And I was like, ah, looks like, uh, you know, Things are starting to get a little shaky over there. And uh, yeah, it was it was more of a controlled effort. And I think just, I don't want to say it was predictable, but uh, Noah does tend to do that. And especially open announcements are hard, man. That's like a tight environment where the crowd's really right on top of you. And um, it's it's easy to get carried away. That's And that's the second time I've done an open announcement with Noah. Um, and the first one we did was very fast. And I think, you know, he benefited a lot from that energy in that context, but that this was a little longer workout. So I was trying to be very careful not to do that. Um, and, you know, I think neither of us really knew how the altitude would affect us either. So I think we kind of both took a big, uh, a big clobbering from that, but yeah, you know, I think that was a bit of a patience play. And you start to slowly see you're reeling them in by like one rep at a time. And uh, once you once you start to see that, that you're like reeling back real estate, you're like, oh, okay, cool. I, I can do this. And that energizes you too. So it's nice when in the back end of a workout, it's nice to be the guy who's, who's you know, pulling the other one in instead of being the guy who's steadily losing ground round after round. That's a tough position to be in. So you better hope you got a long head start. It's the worst. It's literally the worst position in life to be in when you feel your body not listening to what your mind is telling it. And you know all, that you got yourself here, right? Like, ah, I really screwed myself on this one, right? Like, and there's nothing you can do <laughs> except just hang on and do damage control at that point. But you bring up another key aspect to me that the, the, the fittest in our sport continue to show at a very high level, which is self-awareness. Um, through your athletic background, have you always had this ability to like identify who you are in space and time compared to others and still be able to like do your own thing? Or is this something that you learned from CrossFit? Is it something that you learned through life? Was there an influence? Cause you're tremendously self-aware. Everything that you literally just shared about that last workout takes humility and it takes a super honest opinion about where your fitness is currently and how to dictate that pace. I think it's a hard balance as an athlete. Like you need to have an ego as uh, to a certain degree of like, you know, I can do anything I'm invincible. And I think that the best athletes have that. Um, it's hard when that's your whole identity because it won't always be that way. Um, yep. you know, you're going to get beat, you're going to make a bad step, you're going to do something. And if that crumbles your self identity, then you're in a lot of trouble. So I've always had a, I don't know, a reasonable grasp of that. And I, I think I made the, the conscious decision a long time ago that it will, it wasn't worth the highs to live those lows. Um, so I've always kind of, I'm not like held back, but I, I tend to not I may, I may maybe govern a little bit more than some athletes do. And I don't really ride these emotional highs. I don't, I don't get those like dramatic overconfident moments but I very rarely sink low. 
Um, you know, I've had a lot of bottom finishes and I'm like, that's fine. It's all, it's all, I, I don't go too high. I don't go too low. And I think I learned a bit of that competing in gymnastics where it's a similar sport environment. Like, you know, you, you get several events and one could go amazing and one could go poorly and it doesn't matter. You got to move on to the next one and perform that task independently because they're all scored independently. You know, you, you make finals, you win, you win medals for every individual event. So, you know, you better not, you better not get too caught up in your last performance because it doesn't define you. And so I really took and I, I learned a lot of that as a young kid competing in sports. And I think that, you know, I, I played a career as a lacrosse player and was very similar. It's just like steady, nonstop, tenacious. And I've sort of continued that mentality that like, it's fine. Things will go well, things will go poorly and nothing really matters other than continuing to move forward and, and build on to the next step. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Some of that, like, to be an athlete at a high level takes a certain amount of self-awareness. You need to be humble in your approach. You need to understand the things that you're you're great at, the things that you're bad at. You know, what do you do with that information? And that's the only way you're going to get better. Um, having people around you who hold you accountable to those things, holding yourself accountable to those things. Uh, it, yeah, it, like... I think you, you, you learn that over time, but part of it is like, I think I learned a lot of it from competing in other sports and then just having the right kind of mentors around and working with the right people. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, that's a difficult one. I think that you need to be confident to a certain degree. And that's probably somewhere that I'm, I'm lacking a little bit relative to maybe some of my peers. Um, but I think that it gives me, I, I get something from that in return. I think that I also, I, I don't, I don't feel as deflated when things go poorly because I've kind of expected them to go poorly for a long time. And I think that I'm ready for whatever the worst case scenario is. And I've pictured the worst case scenario and I've prepared for it. Um, you know, I've, I, you, I've always, I've planned ever for every contingency, right? Like I'm always thinking about what's the next thing that'll kill me. And if it's a bad finish here or a bad finish there, I don't care because I've already planned the rebound um, so, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people who think you should never, never picture poor outcomes or never, uh, imagine the bad stuff that'll happen and, you know, have that confidence that things will always go great, but it's just not the case. And I think that the person who never pictures the poor outcome is the person who's unprepared for the poor outcome. So I am always very well prepared because I can't help it. I imagine the bad stuff. Uh, and so, you know, the good, the good thing about that is when you can imagine it, you can prepare for it. I love that, man. You're a realist, right? You're a realist and you understand specifically that life happens and you play a sport where their job, hey, at least, you know, our, our old tester, Dave Castro, his job was to expose weaknesses from within our athletic group, right? Whether it was the community at, at large or whether it was the CrossFit Games, the tip of the spear uh, group that showed up to, to them for the test. So we knew it, eventually it would happen and you were prepared no matter what. But let me ask you going into this 2022 perspective, what is different this year for you? What has changed? Has there anything that has specifically evolved? I know, you know, being in the space for a while for myself, an important part in order to stay relevant is to continue to try to reinvent yourself in different ways. Um, I know you got a coach, Michelle Latandra, who does a great job with yourself and others, but what, what's different about 2022 for you, Pat? I don't know, honestly. Uh, it's, it's interesting. They all kind of blend together, you know? And I think some changes take time. It's not a one-year path every year mm. that you get to reinvent. Yep. Um, so, you know, there's some things that we've been working on for a year or more um, that are still in, in the process of, you know, it's still under construction. So one thing I'm very proud of and happy with, and that keeps me coming back for more, is that I'm still improving. You know, this year in the quarterfinals, in the total, I, I set new personal bests in all three lifts that we did. And like, you know, I'm 32 this year at the games. Like there's not, there's not a lot that I'm not improving at still. Um, so that's, I mean, that, that makes me feel confident. It makes me feel relevant. It makes me feel like, you know, I've obviously still got more to give and it makes it fun. It's hard to feel stagnant. Um, so one of the big things that we try to do is, you know, find a lot of new ways to test ourselves. And then you, you figure out where those boundaries are. And you also come up with more metrics that you can improve yep. on, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the the improvement is what's addictive in CrossFit. Uh, having so many different areas that you can check in on and test yourself on. That's what got me hooked on it years ago is that, 
you know, I, I didn't like to suck at things and there was a whole lot of things that I could improve on. And then when you start to see that progress quickly, it, uh, it keeps you coming back. So finding a lot of those things, you know, I'm, I'm doing things differently. I've, I've reduced the impact a little bit of my training in some areas because it's harder on my body and I don't recover like I'm 20 anymore. And that's, that's real life. Yep. Uh, it takes, I, I don't sleep 10 hours a night. Like I got, I got things to do. And, and so you, you, you just have to take some of that and make decisions that direct your training. And, you know, my volumes may be different than what some of the young guys are doing. My, my sessions are split up differently. My time is spent a little differently. Um, but you know, that's part of the, the process that working with a, a good team gets you is that you, we, we've learned that over time and said, okay, we've narrowed it down to stuff that's working for me. You know, last year, what we did obviously worked very well again for me. So, you know, we know we're kind of moving in the right direction. We're still seeing strength gains. We're still seeing speed gains. I think a big game for me these days is trying to make sure that I'm healthy. Like more days yep. in the gym is better. Like I just, I can't afford to do something stupid or reckless and then burn two weeks of training because I went for that extra, you know, PR attempt just because I was feeling good that day. Like that's, it's not worth it. Like I very rarely will do things like that. I don't, I don't play around, uh, you know, frivolously these days with, uh, with like those sorts of things. So it's a little bit of just like intelligence and, and staying controlled and being like, you know, what, what's the cost benefit analysis of this session um, and being very directed in the work that you are doing, you know, picking what you're going to do that day. What are the goals of this session and, you know, being deliberate with your practice. Um, Cause it's all very small details at this point. But yeah, I think we're, we're still improving. So, you know, I, I'm happy that things are at least going in the right direction. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm certainly don't take any of it for granted at this point. I'm, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's still being able to compete. You know, I've been doing it for a lot longer than it feels like. Um, and I, it's funny to hear people be like, it's like my like eighth year or something like that. And I'm mm -hmm. like, man, it feels like not that long. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a privilege to be able to do it that long and still be very competitive and, you know, see the landscape change beneath me. Uh, I remember watching you compete and, and competing. I remember competing the same year when you were individual in 2016, beating your event record on the running GHD deadlift workout. <laughs> uh, I remember all that stuff. I love it, it man. Feels like, it feels like yesterday. So I, uh, it's, it's very cool to be able to still be doing it this far down the road. I love it, man. That's that's definitely one of the only events I'd have a chance at hanging even close with Jan right there. That's written up. That's an Adrian Conway special right there. <laughs> Running GHD sit-ups and heavy deadlifts. Let's do that all day, twice yeah, over. I think it was – you had the record, but then Austin Maliolo was yep. in our region as well, and then he broke it the heat before me, and then I broke it again right after he went. Yep, uh, I, I, I like – by like two seconds. I remember. <laughs> I remember vividly. And I had no competition in our region. I was looking around like, oh man, I actually did really well. Ah, see, that, I, I don't ever win events. I don't ever win events, Pat. Even even yeah. when I was qualifying for the games as an individual, I didn't win events. I just was the guy that didn't suck it terribly too much. So um, I love that. Well, listen, I know that you have previously won the CrossFit Open, right? Um, that particular right. year was a weird year, 2020. You didn't actually end up advancing and getting to go to Aromas to be a part of that crew to qualify or to like compete and throw down. This year, the Open went very differently for you in regards to your placing, and I'm assuming the effort and the repeatability there. You know, the focus that you put even in that. What changed there, and why? Uh, actually, like it might surprise people to know that in 2020, when I won the Open, I there wasn't a lot of difference in terms of like effort or. Uh, I, I did, I only redid the last workout. I did the open announcement for the last workout, uh, live in Boston. And that was one where you got to decide how to break things up. So I had like, um, two minutes to figure out how I was going to do this thing, which was just not enough time. <laughs> so I did one and it was a disaster. And then I, I redid it two days later and, uh, did very well at it. And that, I won that year. And that was just like, I think the Open was well suited for me that year. It was like all workouts for time, some stuff that I was good at. Um, but I had, yeah, it was like one and done all that year pretty much, except wow. for, and I, and I went away like every weekend almost, which is like probably not what you should be doing during the Open. Amen. But this last year, I think the way that the seasons have changed, 2021 and 2022, the way the Open quarterfinals and things go, um, I don't know. I, I've, I've got that feather in my cap now, I guess, too. I've scratched that itch and I don't feel the need to try to win the Open anymore. Um, so I, I just sort of 
put it forward, get through to the next stage, um, and then take on the quarterfinals after that. There's not a lot uh, of weight that I put into the open these days or, or truthfully any online competition. Um, I think that the, the quarterfinals for me is just to get to the semifinals and be in the, in the top heat. And for a lot of people, their goals are very different and it's certainly no slight on what people's goals are, but I, I, my approach is that, you know, I, I just want to keep advancing to the next stages, especially when I'm doing things like competing in the rogue invitational competing at Wadapalooza, there's no opportunity for an off season there. So after Wadapalooza, the open, the quarterfinals, that's a period where I can sort of dial things down a little bit um, and just kind of level off to a cruising altitude, not do anything too reckless, not try to keep the fire lit and burning too hot, and then start to ramp it back up for, you know, post quarterfinals. I'm competing in the last semifinal. I, after quarterfinals were done, I had like eight weeks. So now that's a big lead in. That's a big runway to get ready for semis. And so, you know, you have to make plans based on what your your whole roadmap of the year looks like. So we have to zoom out a bit and say like, you know, where are the priorities here and, and what do we want to do? So it is, uh, it's been different for sure the last couple of years. That year, 2020 was definitely an interesting year. There was a lot of online competition. There was a lot of, uh, you know, I, I dealt with an injury right before the online stage as well. And that year we competed the Rogue Invitational online too. It was just, too much online competition. I, I'm like, I'm tired of it. I, I like the, I like the adrenaline competing live. I like brushing shoulders. I like that kind of stuff. It makes you feel alive. The online competition is just, it's a, it's a necessary evil, but it's not, uh, it's not something that I, I look forward to. I would say. Absolutely, man. And I completely understand that. I feel the same way. I, I, you know, for, for many years, I would, I would dread the open and its approach and the way we have to test there and the movements that we test there in high volume. And I couldn't wait to get on the floor at the regional or the super regional or the semifinal level, whatever it was. Um, but I couldn't, but help it here. Noise in the background, man. Tell me, how is it being a Papa bear, man? How's fatherhood? It's good. Owen's, uh, he's like 11 months old now, 11 months in one week, pretty much. So he's good. My wife just got back from, uh, she was out at work and she, just brought him back home and i think he probably needs to well they were in victoria which is like an hour and a half away so i, I think probably he is overdue from his nap and didn't sleep well on the drive home mm. so i'm sure he needs to have a nap and uh i don't know he probably has needs a snack or something it's been fantastic though he's actually yeah. a very good baby i think we're very lucky um my wife's just gotten back to work after m her maternity leave so um it's been good. We've been like, you know, trying to figure out where all the pieces fit. That's always the, the, the struggle. And it's all, it's all communication. It's figuring out who can, who takes what shift when and where I can fit my training in when she's working, when I'm working. And uh, we pretty much just keep him in the air the whole time. And uh, he's pretty good, but he's, he's a good dude. He, he makes it easy on us. I think he sleeps pretty well. He eats pretty well. He poops regularly. It's like kind of all the things you need. Uh, that's what we like make us worry he doesn't make us worry too much that's for sure we definitely we stress about other things not usually much about him well hey owen if one day you watch this man good job you're helping your dad out a lot that's awesome um <laughs> which actually brings me to my next question dude why do you work you know you're 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 the, the second fittest man in the world after last year you've been on the podium several times i know that you have plenty of support in regards to sponsorships and opportunities to support your lifestyle and training so why is it that you choose to still have a career and still do your thing that way there's a few reasons um sometimes i ask myself the same question but <laughs> uh i think for one thing uh, truth be told, it's a safety net in some ways. Sure. Um, sports careers are fickle. I think you can be, the sun can be shining on you one day and then uh, things can take a turn for the worst. You could get hurt. Something could happen. CrossFit could completely collapse like it almost did a couple of years ago. You know, there, there's a lot of things that can happen. And I, and I think that choosing to compete a career in sports, that's something that you need to be aware of. And I think you need to prepare for um for the bad times. And so some people spend a lot of time creating branding and, and existing in the fitness sphere. And I've done a little bit less of that. I've mm -hmm. chosen to live an academic route because it's something I'm also passionate about. And it takes a lot of work. You know, I spent a lot of years cultivating my education and spending a lot of hours turning in assignments and studying for exams. And it would feel a shame to let it fall to the wayside. 
I think the plan has always been that at some point I'll stop competing and I'll start working more and the balance will shift that direction. So, you know, the question is how confident or competent will you be if you've not done anything for five, six years post your education, and then all of a sudden you want to just fire back up in clinic, there's a lot of continuing education you should probably be doing or things you should be doing. And I think I don't work a ton, uh, but I keep enough touch points in. I work a few clinic days a week and I get enough hours in that, you know, you keep your education rolling and you keep your hands moving and you keep your skills sharp. So it's certainly something that, you know, from a clinical perspective, my CrossFit career is like kind of a cool privilege because it takes also a little bit of the stress off of my clinical life where I don't need to, I can practice the way I, I think I should. And I can, you know, give patients extra time because it's not my life, my hundred percent livelihood to be pumping people through the clinic nonstop. Right. So I think I can take a certain level of care. That's very cool. And maybe a little bit rare uh, in my field. So I think it's it's fun. It's also something that brings my wife and I together because she's a family doctor. She works in the medical community. And so it gives us some common ground to talk about as well, right? So I'm not just talking about CrossFit nonstop to her. Um, and at the same time, it's it's a reprieve for me. Like I think yep. when you are a, an athlete and everyone around you wants to talk to you about CrossFit and everyone everything you know is CrossFit and whatever, like I mentioned before, the season is long. And if all year, that's all I have on the brain, um, I, I, it feels like a, a, a quick route to burnout uh, in some ways. And and so I think we just always tried to live, have, have another life that's kind of ours. And then we have this other life on the side. And um, it's nice to be able to turn away from one into the other. And it's a bit of a form of escapism sometimes where training can be going bad for weeks at a time sometimes and it's nice to be able to just sort of turn off the lights there and then go somewhere else and spend your time there and do something else that pulls your attention completely away from that um, and then at the same time when I'm not working and I, I shut the doors of the office I can go to the gym and you know flush my brain out and I don't have to think about all kinds of you know ramifications of clinical judgments I've made that day I can just do grunt work and sit on a bike and atone for whatever. Right. So I think it's, it's, there's a few different reasons why, but I think my whole career as a, as a CrossFit athlete, I've always had something else that's taken up a, a, some amount of time. Uh, so when I was in school, it was the actual education, but now it's just the actual job. Um, so I, I, it's hard for me to picture doing one without the other at this point, it just sort of feels like um, I'm most effective when I have sort of a couple things that I can dip into uh, and that's just kind of how it is. Oh man. Yeah. It's balance. I think it's a great example. Honestly, there's a lot of young folks out there that are completely misled and, and misunderstand, um, what full commitment looks like to this sport and what it actually is going to be like living it day in and day out with nothing else other than finding your identity or your whole lifestyle and career in being a professional exerciser, quote unquote. Right. And I've always tried to find a lightheartedness and a balance in it for me where it's like, Hey, uh, yeah, I'm a, you know, my wife's friends might ask me what I do. And I'm like, Oh, I kind of, I do competitive exercise. I just, I exercise fast. And that's kind of what I do on the side aside from coaching. That's about, that's about what, what makes me who I am. And so try, try having that conversation in a room full of doctors. Oh my. <laughs> I just, I just like, I just tell them I'm a chiropractor and they're like, cool. I just leave it out. We don't even mention it. <laughs> yeah. They're like, they're, but they're picking up, see, they're picking up your Hank McCoy vibes, man. Your X-Men, the beast, yeah. natural physique. They're like, oh yeah, but there's something about like, that guy. Really? Like I, really? I swear, like, I think I just got these Reebok shoes and I think I might've seen, you know, <laughs> I know you got, you got different ties now, but for years, that's where they would have saw your face, man. Um, yeah. But no, your point is a good one that I think people, um, I don't know. I, I always try to tell people that it's nice to have something else to turn away from. And, and I, I've often been to, I told, oh, you know, you should have stopped working or stopped going to school to commit full time. And then just imagine what you could have done. And I'm not entirely convinced that I would have done better. I don't think that that's necessarily the case for everyone. I think we look at our archetypes and it's easy to look at someone like Matt and say, well, look at, you know, he gave up everything and then he did this. And I'm a different guy. Like yep. everyone's different and it's the way it works. You have to figure out your path and what works well for you. And when you find something that works, like don't, don't always keep trying to fix it. Uh, like sometimes you can just sort of beat your own path and figure it out and, and, and stay the course and it works out fine. That's it, man. You're a guru too. Look at that great advice. Hopefully you guys are taking notes on this. 
What do you think, Pat, about the semifinals, man? The programming that you've seen so far, some of the events that are laid out. Of course, we know two of the ones that you're going to be going through, but have you looked at the layout of these other ones that are thrown down this weekend? I have seen a few of them. Uh, I feel like people always send them to me. Uh, <laughs> I believe it. I, yeah, they want to know your opinion. A, I mean, there's some doozies in there that I'm happy to not be doing. I'll tell yep. you that much. Uh, and there's some that I will definitely be tuning in to watch my friends like go to town on. So uh, it'll be fun to watch. I think it's, I always like to be a spectator. I think there's something funny about, you know, I, I put myself in that pit a lot of times where I'm just like, you know, you are fighting for your life in some of those events. And so there's something very satisfying in watching your friends and peers <laughs> do it and knowing that you have no skin in the game. And like, I don't even have to worry about having to do that workout. Like I, it's cool. Like I'm not going to do this later. Like I'm, this is all yours and they'll, it's just, I'm definitely going to love watching it. There's a few that come to mind. The Torian pro has that, uh, echo bike chest bar. Yes. Two workout. minute intervals. Oh yeah. Yeah. That one's going to be awesome. Uh, the Lowlands has that dumbbell thruster chest to bar box jump over. That's a similar format, but just for max reps. Oh, um, that's going to be a fun one to watch. The, the Lowlands has some actually like savage ones. Their devil press one with the dumbbell or the D balls. No one will finish that workout. Um, they, what else did they have? They're running axle bar deadlift handstand walk workout looks like it's going to crush people's crush. posterior chain yep um trying to think of what syndicates got going on they got lots of machines they're actually like you know lots of grindy workouts but i don't think anything that's gonna like ruin people's days yeah they got uh, the uh they got the the 10 to 50 yeah. ascending ladder ghd sit up wall ball ski erg ski right? and then you yeah. got a handstand walk after each round of that That'll be a little nasty. The one, one was like Echo Bike Torque Tank and yes, else. yep. That's 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 the event before that event. So that's event three, Echo. Yeah. Like it's Echo, a lot of dumbbell stuff descending oh, thirty twenty ten. Dumbbell burpees. Dumbbell burpee like. deadlifts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested so to it, see how that goes. Me too. Um, I think, I think it's going to be pretty fast. Blast the bike pretty hard on that. Yep, I agree. Yeah. I think you can get a little reckless with that. There's not a lot. There's not a I, lot of skill I, involved. And burpee burpees are like slow and you can almost recover. Yep. I actually, uh, I, I gave some, I told some people that they should go harder on the bike than they think. So I hope I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I hope they, I hope they take some advice. It'll be or, interesting. Or maybe, maybe they're, I'm wrong and they just blow up and die and you shouldn't have listened to me. Hey, I'm you shouldn't, have, you should have take your own advice. Exactly. Listen, yeah. w when it comes to programming, Pat, are you one that's often super critical? Like for example, when we get the Atlas games, programming I'll, I'll be commentating that event you'll be thrown down on the floor are you going to be like oh man what were they thinking here are you just kind of like okay this is the work let's go dude always i will always look at it and be like this one's stupid should be this <laughs> should be that and then I love it. I'll, I'll i'll slowly come around to it and then i'll end up doing it and being like yeah okay it was fine but sure I'll always it's just like i don't know if it's like a protection mechanism that i'll initially just be like Oh God, no. Like, I don't want to do that. It looks bad. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I'm sure I will have thoughts about everything, about how it could be slightly better, but whatever. It is what it is, right? And everybody's doing the same thing. So I hope that one of the challenges that they're going to have, I think, is balancing time domains and things. I, yes. I kind of think that CrossFit should have programmed a short workout and a long workout and not a lift because a lift is a bit easier to just do whatever. It does... It, it makes it so that everybody going into the games has tested the sure. same lift, which is a problem that they had last year. Right. Because a lot of people tested a one arm snatch and then we did it again at the games. Yep. It was a bit redundant. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I kind of wish they programmed a longer workout because it seems like a lot of the events are programming some shorter ones that are, that are good. And I, sometimes the long ones get a bit, I don't know, people can get weird with the volume or try some yeah. really interesting things. And so, I don't know, I, that part of me initially was like, ah, I kind of wish that was the case, but I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm, I'm curious to see how this rope climb workout pans out, like how they set the floors up and stuff. If it's, if it really looks like the 2014 event, cause that the men are going to do that real fast. Yep. It's uh, going to be real fast, man. I think it's going to be cool to see the, the way the women have progressed in a legless rope climb, um, relative to, 
to 2014, but you know, it was a sprint in 2014 for the men and it's going to be an even bigger sprint. Uh, like that was my second live competition ever doing that workout at regionals. And I finished that workout and remember being like, oh, I should have ran way faster. Yep. Like the rope climbs were way less of a factor than I thought they would be. And I was like, I think I finished like seventh in that event. And now like I will go a minute faster and probably still feel like similar. Right. Like it's yep. just, it, it, it's going to be an interesting event. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't help but feel like there might've been a way to make that a better um, test. I'm not sure what we're testing, I guess. Cause you're certainly not testing leg with rope climbs for the men. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, and I think the beauty of it isn't it. And we start to get in this conversation eventually when we, when we get a chance to sit down and really nerd on this, which I'd love to connect to another time, but it's like, yeah. we, we, we get to really think now, are we, are we, are we testing aspects of fitness or are we take testing movements of fitness? So it's like, we do have speed, agility, power, and there is going to be a bit of a strength and stamina involved in that. When we think about the 10 general physical traits of, you know, what we define as CrossFit and fitness, right? So those things are, are, are there and they sit, they tend to be elusive in our sport because, and I'm the same way when I look at a workout, I'm like, okay, what are we testing? Instead, it's like, well, from, from a general perspective now, for me as a spectator or a commentator, I'm like, man, I just want to see a performance in a race. And it's less about what exactly is the intended outcome because we can leave that yeah. to training to a degree and we just want to see who can throw down and win this event. So, yeah. So what, what it will be is an execution test. hundred percent. Like there is no space for error and, and that's, it's fine. I have like accuracy. Ending, I sometimes have a problem with execution tests, but that is what competition is. And it's, it's going to be like a bit of a test of recklessness and a bit of a test of, uh, of, um, and of execution, like who, somebody who can be very aggressive and like borderline reckless may just find it just enough success in that event, but it's, yep. it's going to be a very exciting close race. No doubt. The question is just like, is there any difference? Like when, when five people finish within one second, was any one of them better than the other? So is it a really, is it a good test in that regard? I don't know. I would say that they're equally matched, right? But that's going to be a 20 point swing between different athletes, right? So yep. that that's what's tough in an event like that. Um, so, you know, uh, it will be very exciting. But I've often said that it's the athletes that make the event exciting, not the test. Um, in a lot of cases, that's, you know, there are very cool tests. But like, you could flick a nickel into the middle of a football field and tell the first person that gets it and gets it to the end zone gets 100 points. And it would be exciting as shit. So <laughs> you're not you, lying, like, man. The, a- the lying. athletes, the athletes tell the story. The athletes make it exciting. That's you can it. Make the test, whatever you want. That's and it. And they're going to find a way to make it exciting. Cause that's the drama. It's the human element of it. That's, that's dramatic and exciting. So, you know, th- those races will be tight and there will be heartbreak and there will be whatever. It almost should have been like, a. I don't think cross uh, mandated the order that they had to have those events. So, nope. um, they almost should have had it as a finale or something. It's a bit of a, like, too much back and forth for a finale for my liking, but it will be, there's drama to be had there. There's going to sure. be some drama. Hey, maybe they'll throw us a bone and it'll be the finale in Atlas. You never know, man. Hey, maybe we'll, we'll have to see, but brother, listen, I appreciate your time so much, man. I thank you for hopping on this. I want to let you go and get to your family. And I know you got some recovery lined up and all good things to get you ready for the Atlas games that are coming up and the rest of the 2022 season. Look, from here at the show, Rising Pod, man, we want this to be the best year yet for Pat Vellner. We're huge fans. Um, I've followed you a long time, and I want all positive vibes. And I want this, when you look back on this season, man, to really just think, like, you let it all out there, and you executed to your best ability because you knew that was enough. You know what I'm saying? So I hope that for you, man. I thank you for your time and appreciate you joining us. Hey, it's my pleasure. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for the kind words. Peace, guys. Thanks for joining us.